namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami So, for those of you who don't know, that's the usual way we begin a talk in our tradition, and it's uh, a salutation to the Triple Gem, which uh, is the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And this is relevant because today I wanted to talk about uh, the concept of refuge and safety. And traditionally, the moment that one enters onto the path in a more formal way is when one takes refuge in these three gems, in this treasure, in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And sometimes there's a ceremony to it, um, but other times it can just be a very strong determination to align one's life with the truths embodied in that recollection. And the recollection is more multifaceted than one can think at first. They're referred to as the three gems, and gems have this quality of uh, being multifaceted, of having different ways one can see them, of reflecting light through them in various patterns. Um, and similarly, the, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha can be looked at in a variety of ways and are taking refuge in them and establishing our life in line with them can also be conceived in different ways. So the first gem of the Buddha, historic, the historical Buddha, each of these gems has uh, at least um, two aspects which are spoken of most often. And for that of the Buddha, we have the historical uh, Siddhartha Gautama um, who went forth um, and left, uh, as most of you know, a life of plenty and gave himself completely to discovering a way of transcending the condition of suffering and stress and birth and death, which bound uh, everyone around him, in which he realized also bound him. And for me, or for many, this external level of taking refuge in the Buddha can be off-putting as modern people somewhat averse to the idea of placing uh, faith or worshipping any external figure. And this is sometimes compounded by the representation of the Buddha in the form of a statue. But as we read the suttas and hear his teachings, 
I think there is a place for recognizing um, at the very least what an astounding teacher this was. Uh, the collection of material the Buddha left behind, uh, what's referred to as the uh, Sutta or the Tripitaka, um, specifically the Sutta Pitaka, uh, is an enormous body of material. I believe it's 12 times the length of the Bible, um, 22,000 pages or so if it was written all down. Uh, there's uh, Burmese Tripitaka chanters who chant the whole thing from memory and it takes them 30 days at 10 hours a day to do so. Um, and simultaneously the Buddha's establishing of the uh, order of monastics, uh, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, of uh, practitioners who still led the lay life and this concise articulation of the teaching which avoided every one of the, uh, the philosophical pitfalls which have trapped Western philosophers for about 2,500 years, more or less. Um, so really, the Buddha avoided so many of these questions, such as, you know, where did we come from? Uh, do we have free will? Um, he focused rather on what he referred to as the handful of leaves when he, uh, in a famous discourse, pointed out all the leaves in the uh, forest he was in with the bhikkhus and said, bhikkhus, what is more, the leaves in my hand or that in the forest, those in the forest? And the bhikkhus said, bante, those in your hand. And he said, or those in the forest are more. And he said, just so that which I have known through direct knowledge can be compared to the leaves in the forest. But that which I teach is just this suffering and the end of suffering, just like the leaves in my hand. And the restraint it took to limit his articulation to such simple and concise terms, focusing on the real problem of suffering, is an astounding feat of wisdom. And that concision and focus is what I think has allowed the Buddhist teaching to survive for so long. The monastic order is humanity's oldest institution, uh, except, I believe, the Jain monastics. I think they beat us by a few years. But this is a great gift, and just the appreciation of that level of wisdom uh, has a place, and placing our trust in that. However, the second level of the first gem of the Buddha, and this is the one that is perhaps the most powerful, is what the Buddha represented, uh, which was the pure knowing. And this is something that we are careful to not reify, to not uh, articulate in too much detail because uh, the Buddha avoided it. And um, I think anyone who wasn't enlightened uh, would be advised to stay, uh, to be very careful about such things. Um, and I certainly am far from being able to talk about these things in uh, any clear terms, but pointing to what um, the great teachers in this tradition have spoken of as the one who knows. In Thai, it's called the Puru. And this quality of transcendence, um, I think we can speak about it in certain certain ways. We can maybe approach it and speak to how the suttas talk about it. Um, and more than anything, speak to the idea of the fact, the simple fact that there is something in the human being which is transcendent of conditions. I was having a conversation yesterday with 
a friend who spoke about the moment about five years ago when he read about the killing fields, how it rocked him to his core because he suddenly saw the world as a chaotic and dangerous place bereft of real order or real refuge. And I think the world can appear this way um, unless we have some teaching pointing us to the fact that there is something in us which is capable of moving beyond and above even the most brutal conditions that one encounters in the world. So there is something in the human heart that allows a Tibetan Lama to be detained by the Chinese in prison for 20 years under torture. And afterwards, when he had been released and was asked if he was afraid during that period, he said, I was afraid of one thing, and that was that I would lose the ability to love my captors, and I would begin to hate them. But he hadn't given in to that. And the mere fact that there's something in the human heart which can transcend conditions at that level, that can exist in such a hell and yet be unsoiled by even the most brutal of conditions one can find one, oneself in and remain equanimous and caring towards even those who are by the worldly standard completely deserving of one's content, contempt and hatred. That is transcendence. And it does not have to be an ontological truth. It doesn't have to be spoken of in this context as an immaterial aspect of the mind. We don't have to get into any of that, but we can point to the simple fact that there is some thing in the human heart which can rise above even that. And I remember being so hungry for that when I was growing up. I knew many people who were good people and fairly happy in the way that people are happy that you meet every day and kind and wonderful in the blessed circles that I lived in um, and which most of, us, most of us live in. But there was something in me which felt that there is a potential beyond that. And you get glimmers of it. You see the Dalai Lama on television. You hear about Nelson Mandela. You read about the saints. And something in you intuits that we can be meant for more than just this level of vague contentment or fairly well-rounded life as it is conceptualized in our society and even in the more refined places of our society as, say, a life surrounded by good relationships and uh, nice trips outside and art. These are all good things, but there's something in us which knows that some element of us is worthy of something even more and capable of something even more. And then I went to Thailand and I met uh, 
beings who had, I believe, completely purified their hearts in a way that most people do not believe is possible. And similarly, there are teachers like that who I've met in the United States, I believe, and in else, elsewhere now. And the deeper we move into these circles of practice and practitioners, the more I think we can count on meeting people like that. And I think the proper response is to be truly shaken, to know what we are capable of giving ourselves to and becoming and actually encountering that and seeing clearly the results of a life of dedicated practice can reorient a whole life because we see what we are capable of and intuit that that is the most worthy of goals. And that path does not have to be um, walked as a monastic, obviously. I mean, a dedicated practitioner can encounter uh, or, or can move towards these things as well. And um, the Buddha's suttas are full of examples of uh, lay men and women encountering levels of awakening. And similarly, there's uh, a book uh, by Alexander Shultzenitsyn called The Gulag Archipelago. Uh, and he wrote it when he was in the Soviet gulags, the work camps. And he kept it all in his head. He wrote it in his head, and that was what kept him going. But these, the gulags were the most hellish conditions that one could uh, imagine, perhaps. Um, and he, he wrote about this, and it is a book that brought down the Soviet Union in many ways. It uh, revealed what was really going on. And he um, encountered during his time, his decade, over a decade of time in these work camps, a few souls, a few people who had managed to remain completely uncontaminated by even those most brutal of circumstances. He tells the story of one man who would not lie for anything. And the work... Uh, camp guards tried to put him in a fairly comfortable role as an overseer of uh, certain aspects of the work, uh, which would have provided him with a lot of benefits, but it required him to doctor the books a little bit and lie about certain numbers of hours work just a little bit, but he wouldn't do it. And he had to forego that chance. And yet this character and others like him were somehow, because they had this refuge in their morality and in some foundation that was completely or mostly immune to even these circumstances, they were somehow untouched at a deep level by even those circumstances. And those examples are what I think kept Schultzenitzen inspired and allowed him a continued faith in humanity even through those brutal years. And this is transcendence of a kind. And there's a phrase in the suttas that because of one's morality one can go anywhere and is not afraid um, and also the buddha turn uh, speaks of five kinds of loss relatives wealth health right view and morality and he says of all those five the first three are trifling 
Um, and the last two are of utmost importance. And that isn't to minimize the loss many have suffered uh, at the hands of those first three. Um, I don't mean to say that at all. But just to point that there, if we maintain those latter two, those we have control over, and those can sustain a human heart, even through the most brutal of circumstances, and that is a refuge. So this potential for transcendence, this thought and intuition that there's something in us that is capable of absolute purity and care, even in the midst of the most brutal circumstances, that is a refuge. And we can take the first gem at least as that much um, without getting too caught up in exactly what the one who knows is. We know that there's something in us and in the human which is transcendent of conditions. The second gem of the Dhamma or the teaching, the truth, I've spoken at the beginning of this talk about the body of teachings as contained in the texts, their breadth and restraint, their specificity, the fact that they steer as much as possible away from describing the world and more pointing one to how one interacts or should interact with the world and with one's own mind to cultivate a pure heart and to transcend conditions of suffering and to make oneself a blessing for uh, all those around one. And um, I think as we read and practice more, that appreciation grows. But I think speaking to the second aspect um, and, and that first aspect could be considered the Dhamma as the teaching. The second aspect could be maybe considered the Dhamma as truth and what it means to really um, see uh, or encounter reality in that way. Um, but this first aspect of the Dhamma as the teaching includes the path of practice and the path of Dhamma. And the Buddha spoke about the Noble Eightfold Path as the way from suffering. And there is a Sutta called the Mahanama Sutta uh, in the Anguttara Nikaya, the Numbered Discourses, where the Buddha speaks about the Triple Gem and how one should recollect. And he says that one should recollect the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And whenever one's mind is focused on the Buddha, the Dhamma, or the Sangha, One's mind is not overcome with delusion, not overcome with greed, not overcome with aversion. It heads straight based on that recollection. And as it heads straight, it gains a sense of the Dhamma, gains a sense of the meaning, gains joy connected with the meaning. And in one of joyful mind, rapture arises. And of one of a rapturous mind, the body becomes tranquil. The tranquil body leads the mind to encounter unification or samadhi. And what I find so powerful in this is the sense of 
purpose that he's pointing to. And the fact that when one really takes refuge in the Dhamma, there's a sense of orienting one's life towards this goal and this purpose in the Dhamma, in the teaching on this path. Because the difficulty in the world that is so starkly illustrated in the example of the Soviet gulags or the brutal conditions in a prison require us to find refuge. But also, the sense of insecurity underlying even the most comfortable lives that we live in extremely blessed material circumstances also require us to find a refuge because there's suffering here as well and it's no small thing. And it's all the more insidious because the suffering and dilution of our character and purpose that occurs in modern suburban society and modern suburban life happens slowly and in a way we barely notice. And it is instead the steady dilution of our core and of our intuition of who we truly are capable of being and of what our life is truly worthy of, a steady dilution of that in a confluence of comfort and convenience and a subtle loneliness. And I know in my life I experienced this as just a vague sense that I wasn't living a life worthy of my death, of I wasn't living in line with what I was capable of. And it was the things I did um, and dedicated myself to in high school and college were, were good. You know, I lived a good life and, um, you know, tried to undertake good works where possible, had good relationships, was kind. And yet something in me, there was a vague queasiness that knew that it wasn't quite, quite right. And I wasn't living a life that was really worthy of what I, I knew I was capable of. And steadily, the intimacy I had with the world crusted over as it does with the years. And one becomes fractured in distraction and in duties that are less important to one than than those which really are essential. And that vague dilution of who I really was, was no trifling loss. And that requires refuge. The depression rates in modern America are enormous. I believe they've compared certain uh, depression rates in Nigeria to those in um, the uh, in, in the US and also in rural versus urban populations in those situations and depression rates in the US were far higher uh, specifically in urban environments and some studies have shown a uh, depression rates in some developed countries as six times as high as, say, more intimately or close-knit communities in less developed uh, countries. And not to glorify poverty, and not to say that these statistics would apply to uh, 
situations where people did not have enough to live on at all. But to say that uh, even a life that seems on the surface perfect and extremely blessed by every standard that society gives us to judge it by can wear away at our hearts too. And in a sense, this is because what we want is not a safe place because the world can never be that. And we know that deep down. Even the most blessed life will involve loss of those we love. The people we care for will change. We will lose them. We will not live up to the standards we set for ourselves. Suffering will always be there as a splinter in us. So we know intuitively that it can't be a refuge or safe in that sense. So the only real refuge is a purpose that justifies and ennobles even that level of suffering that we inevitably encounter in life. So refuge can be this purpose. And I think it's like, this I think is part of why the Dhamma is a refuge, why the path is a refuge, and why in this Mahanama Sutta, when the Buddha speaks of, when one recollects the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, one's mind heads straight, and one gains a sense of the Dhamma, a sense of the meaning, a joy connected to the Dhamma. And for me, that indicates this miracle that when one begins to walk this path, suddenly there's a trajectory towards the highest aspiration in one's heart and that holds and sustains one and it justifies every suffering we encounter and it turns every loss into a lesson and a chance to be shaped into an instrument worthy of our deepest potential as humans. Because one thing that tradition had provided civilization for, with, was a canopy of meaning, which could sustain and protect us from the insecurity of life. And each of these canopies, many of them were imperfect. Different religious systems um, have a great deal of blood on their hands, obviously, and have been imperfect in many ways, but they've done great things also. And I think one of the great tragedies of modern people who have put aside each of those systems and is that they've been left with nothing, no canopy of meaning. And this is what the Dhamma gives us, is a canopy of meaning. Once again, that is, doesn't require a huge leap of faith. Um, at its most basic level, it can just be the dedication and aspiration to practice as much and as sincerely as one can. And it overlays every experience and even the most mundane life, even the most mundane circumstances of modern suburban life or living in a monastery doing the same thing most days, suddenly becomes not some soul-numbing routine, but rather each act becomes an opportunity to cultivate the heart. When we bring the Four Noble Truths to any action, of seeing the suffering in that action, of seeing the cause of suffering, craving, of seeing the cessation of that suffering and the path to that cessation, 
in the cultivation of care, of a mind of loving kindness, of purity of heart, of the aspiration to not lie, to not hurt, to not be anything less than we know ourselves capable of being, then every action becomes imbued with immense power and immense meaning. And the hero's journey, which we all crave in terms of the journey and story, which we know our lives are meant to embody, of moving towards our highest potential. The hero's journey has a tan chance to manifest even in the most simple life. And the Buddha said that the best way to give was to give as an ornament of the mind. And if every action we undertake is undertaken as an ornament of the mind, then there are no small actions. And then our lives become pregnant and imbued with a meaning which has no equal. Because every action is in service of the highest potential of a human being, of the transcendent. And if that's cultivated, then one can sustain oneself and have refuge even in circumstances of hell on earth. And one can grow and flourish even in not just those circumstances, but also in the admittedly and insidiously difficult and diluting and fractured lives which we find ourselves in. And it's important in that one sutta I mentioned, the Mahanama Sutta, that it says that when one's mind becomes joyful, filled with rapture, and one's body becomes tranquil, and the tranquil body is conducive to samadhi, concentration, that at each of those moments, the Buddha is pointing to meditation. It's the refrain. And that's the essential anchor for all of this. If this canopy of meaning is to be brought over our lives, if we are to get a sense more and more for the transcendent in us, for our potential. If we are to have the stability of mind and heart and the mindfulness to bring the Four Noble Truths and the path to bear on every action, no matter how trivial, then we need the anchor of meditation every day. because it's what allows the quieter voices of our nature to speak. And it's what tunes our vision and our hearing to the subtle notes that will guide us. And it's what lets us step back enough from the difficult conditions we find ourselves in and the tragedy into a safe spot but we can trust it. And it's an immense blessing. 
and one's life becomes brighter and brighter. This is not a dour teaching. The Buddha was not a pessimist. He could point to suffering because he had transcended it so profoundly. And similarly, we can acknowledge as practitioners the tragedy of the world at times because we also know the brightness of the world at times. And this is the strange paradox of the practice is when we remove ourselves a little bit from conditions by meditating, by maintaining that small distance of mindfulness, then we also acquire the ability to interact most fully with existence and most beautifully with it and most gracefully. The epithet, uh, epithet the Buddha used for himself uh, was the Tathagata, which because of a aspect of Pali language means both thus come and thus gone. So it means one come to perfect transcendence, but also one gone, or one come to thusness, but also one gone to thusness, and embodies this paradox of transcendence and imminence. And obviously, the Buddha was the most stark and potent example of that, but we can all sense that movement in our lives, that when we do meditate, when we do cultivate this transcendent path, then we are really able to be there with the world and with our lives in a way we weren't before. And when we sit down with someone, we can really be with them because we're not obsessed with ourselves. And that's a gift. And the final gem is the Sangha, which traditionally would mean the monastic Sangha the Buddha set up. And more than that, the beings who have encountered some level of awakening and I've heard teachers refer to it as the Sangha is the Buddha is the one who knows the Dhamma is the truth and the Sangha is what happens when the one who knows knows truth how that it, it manifests in the world and I think when we encounter beings who have done that, it really is a refuge to know that someone's capable of that and that we are as well. And I think today it's also worth looking to a, fa a facet of that gem as well in terms of the community, um, which the Buddha traditionally referred to as Pari uh, the Parissa, uh, of practitioners which hold us all and which we are currently giving ourselves to even by joining into this talk and listening, coming into monasteries. And we need that. Uh, we need friends on this path. We need those to support us and to keep us on the right track. So if we have a chance to encounter beings who have purified their hearts, then that is a great blessing. And the more we can meet and be with those people, then that should be done. But perhaps in times of COVID and others, um, also valuing this aspect of community and what it means to have such good friends. And um, 
it's how we can keep our path straight and find a refuge even in the midst of suffering. <laughs>